Good morning, everyone. So I know we're a faithful few this morning. I know some other people intended to be here, but they are not, so we'll see. I know it's hard to get up early this morning, but we are going to celebrate our sunrise service. Uh, it is a, an abbreviated service. We're actually not going to do the joys and concerns today. Those we'll do in the second service. Um, and there is no uh, offering being collected in this service, but if you want to leave your offering, there are um, the plates in the back of the service, uh, but we'll collect the main offering during our Easter service. Uh, so that is all the announcements that we are going to cover in our sunrise service. Uh, we will begin with an opening prayer. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you overcame death and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we, who celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection, may, by the renewing of your spirit, arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you would, let us stand and sing hymn number 322, Up from the Grave He Arose. singing after four baseball games yesterday, <laughs> but it is still great to celebrate with you. So let us take time just to greet each other this morning with the peace and the love of Jesus Christ.
Start and actually are all from John 20, verses 1 through 31. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not, yet, who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Well, good morning again. And for me, it is exciting to be here today on Resurrection Sunday. I am thrilled to share this moment this morning with you. And not just because there's a big breakfast going to happen afterwards. I don't know about you, but I have enjoyed this sermon series about the miracles of Jesus. Now, I've read most of them over my lifetime, but putting them all together and reading them and studying them every day has been beneficial to me in my life. When we kicked off the sermon series, we talked about some of the famous magicians of the past. And without a doubt, the father of modern magicians was Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini came up in the age of vaudeville performers. Every town, it seemed, had a stage or theater for traveling performers to come and put on their shows. And the bigger cities would have multiple theaters. Harry started his career doing card tricks. At one time, he was billed as the king of cards. And then he evolved to doing more elaborate tricks, great escapes, and grand illusions. The competition for drawing audiences was pretty fierce in his day. And it seemed that every time Harry mastered a new trick, there was a copycat trying to cash in. So Harry had to come up with new tricks that were even bigger and bolder than before. And as his tricks became more and more dangerous, part of the thrill of seeing Harry Houdini was seeing if each trick would become his last. Yet despite all of the incredibly dangerous stunts that Houdini performed, he did not die from any of them. Of all the things that Houdini could have died from, he died at the age of 52 from complications related to a punch in the stomach. Apparently, Houdini was famous for going around to local colleges and daring the strongest guys to punch him in the gut. Because you want to draw a crowd, right? You want to get people frothed up to come see your show. And Harry Houdini was strong. He was small but wiry but a strong man, he would tighten his stomach muscles right before receiving the blow and dare anybody to punch him as hard as he could. And he did this trick maybe hundreds if not thousands of times. Then one day, without warning, it is said, a guy just ran up to him and sucker punched him in the gut before he had time to tighten his abs. The blow to his gut ruptured his appendix and he died despite emergency surgery a few days later. This wasn't exactly the glorious exit that he or others expected. Now throughout the season of Lent, we looked at 40 miracles in our devotions. And we looked in detail at six miracles in our sermon series. Jesus, as we know, like Houdini, routinely drew thousands of people. And think about some of the legendary miracles that we read about. He spoke and he calmed the seas. He fed upwards of 10,000 people and still had leftovers from just a few loaves and fishes. And then right before his triumphal entry into the city, Jesus called out Lazarus from the dead when he had been there for four days rotting and decaying, and out comes Lazarus alive. Now, how does Jesus top that performance, right? A guy who had been dead for four days comes walking out of the tomb? I mean, what other great miracle could Jesus do? Then Jesus was arrested. Jesus was beaten, tried, 
I mean, he barely put up a defense. He was convicted and beaten some more. And then he was nailed to a cross. And it was here on the cross that people dared him to perform one of his miracles. In Luke 23, we read, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his far left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Verse 35 says, The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, for if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. Jesus, who was once the great performer, right? The guy who went around and healed and did all these miracles, was now the object of doubt. He hung in a humiliating fashion, naked on a cross. And now the Jewish people and the leaders were making fun of him. Some great performer, right? Here he is hanging on a cross. And then verse 36 says, The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. First the Jews, and now the Romans mock him. And if that was not insulting enough, Verse 39 says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Not quite the death ending that people expected out of the great miracle worker, is it? The fame from his last miracle quickly eroded as Jesus hung seemingly helpless. Jesus did not call a legion of angels. Jesus did not miraculously heal himself. And there were a lot of things Jesus could have done. Maybe he could have called for the skies and lightning bolts and all kinds of things. But instead of saving himself, he forgives the people who mocked and crucified him. Then what once seemed impossible happened. Jesus died. The disciples and his followers were obviously distraught. I can imagine that they were so disappointed that Jesus just didn't perform one more miracle. Jesus, didn't you have one more trick? Didn't you have one more way to get out of this? All the times we escaped, all the times you did these great things, wasn't there just one more miracle? And if we look at the scriptures, I think it was pretty obvious to to his followers, all hope was lost. The women certainly didn't expect anything from John. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? They expected to find Jesus dead in the tomb, didn't they? They didn't expect anything to happen. They did not expect to find the resurrected Jesus. After all, how could a dead person perform his own miracle, right? Then we continue to read in Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Again, they're saying, come on, you should be expecting something. Why are you looking for someone who's dead? 
In verse 6, they said, he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. It was then that they remembered these words. But after all these women had been through with Jesus, after all the miracles he performed in front of them, and for Mary Magdalene, I mean, Jesus performed a miracle by casting the demons out of her. Yet these women didn't believe or didn't have faith that something was going to happen until the angels appeared to them. And let's not forget about those men who were off locked behind doors, hiding in fear. Verse 9 says, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the, the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Women, do you know any men like this? I'm sure you're really surprised that a group of men refused to listen, right? Calling it, oh, just women talking nonsense, right? And how many times have you been right? Always in our household, all right? Verse 12 says, Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. I mean, wow. Peter, who walked on water with Jesus... Peter, who saw Jesus calm the storm, Peter, who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, and after the women came back and told him this great story about these angels, he failed to grasp that Jesus could really be alive. Don't you sometimes just want to go, Peter? Are you all there? The women doubted, at least at first. The disciples were clueless. And while his own followers failed to think that something good might happen, his foes certainly thought Jesus might pull off one more big stunt. Jumping over to Matthew 27. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Now, how is it the Pharisees, who never seemed to listen to Jesus, certainly remembered his words, yet none of his followers did? And the Pharisees continued to give demands to Pilate. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Isn't that something? The Jewish leaders convinced the Roman ruler that all the miracles Jesus did was a bit of deception. And they were prepared for Jesus to pull off one more of his so-called miracles. Isn't that crazy? People who didn't believe in Jesus are ready for that last miracle, and the followers are the ones off hiding. And it's even more amazing that there were many eyewitnesses who testified that they'd seen Jesus. The women saw, Mary saw, the travelers on the road to Emmaus saw. He appeared to many people. He even appeared to the disciples. And yet, a disciple named Thomas still doubted Jesus could have performed this miracle. In John 20, 24, we heard over here. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. I don't know if for the rest of eternity I want to be known as Doubting Thomas. I mean, all the evidence was there. Everybody said, we saw him, he was here, we ate with him, we walked with him, we did this, we did that. And Thomas says, no, didn't happen, not going to believe it. It's a conspiracy theory, right? A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. As we gather here today to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, I ask you, is this miracle truly a miracle for you? Do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus was really crucified? But more importantly, do you believe that Jesus died and was resurrected? Because when we truly believe, it becomes life-changing. We as Christians need to stop doubting and believe. We as Christians need to be the ones going around and proclaiming that Christ is alive. Because there are people such as myself that will testify to you what having Jesus Christ alive inside of you will do for you. Jesus Christ was not just a historical figure. He was not a legend or a myth. Jesus Christ came, he lived, he was one of us, yet he was fully God. And he surrendered himself to be crucified on our behalf so that we might experience God's love and grace, so that we might be forgiven and receive eternal life. We need to stand firm in our faith. We need to stop doubting and believe. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this resurrection day. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the times that we are like the people in our story. The people who know the truth, but don't fully believe the truth. Lord, let us believe firmly that you are the Son of God. And that you wish to come into our hearts to forgive us and to transform us, and to give us eternal life. Lord, let each of us here today stop doubting and believe. This is our prayer to you today. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our closing hymn, hymn number 318, verses 1, 2, and 5.
Today's going to be a great day for celebrating. So you are all hopefully coming down to breakfast and others will be joining us and we'll say a prayer for that meal here shortly. But I hope you come back for our other service at 1015 where we'll have more hymns and more scripture and more celebration of Jesus Christ. A whole different, completely sermon. Uh, so uh, I hope that, that you are blessed by the richness of this story. The richness of God's love. The greatness of this miracle that Jesus Christ would surrender himself, take upon himself our sins, overcome death, and walk out of the tomb so that we might have an opportunity for eternal life. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you for those who are faithfully gathered here today to celebrate that very first Easter morning when that tomb was discovered empty. Lord, allow us to continue this day of celebration by gathering together for a time of meal and fellowship. Lord, we thank you for all of those who took the time to prepare food, those who prepared this place, and those who have made it a very welcome and opening environment for all people. Lord, uh, uh, lead us and guide us as we continue through our Easter egg hunt and time of service. And Lord, be with us in our second service so that those whose eyes are not been opened, that they will be open to see the miracle of salvation. Lord, let us go from here in peace and love and celebration. This we ask in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.